they came to Jericho. And as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he came and sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight, and he followed him along the way. I am still of an age that the way that movies ended was it said the end. Before they ran the credits or anything else, you know, at the end they had this big sign just to make sure you knew it was the end of the movie. The end. Uh, I can remember a lot of TV shows that I watched of old movies. They would make sure that you knew it was the end. Fini. You know, if you wanted to do it in French, you could really know it was the end of something. But I am convinced that there is no such thing as the end. Whether you had a job that failed, a relationship that changed, whether even death has visited you or people that you love, you know it's really not the end. The end is never finished. The end continues to move on. It persists in our memory. When we're done with a relationship, we play it over and over, sometimes to our own detriment. When we finish a job, whether we like it or not, we play it over and over to the plus and to the minus of our living. And death is the one that really play over and over. Those people are held alive in our memory so much. Things that we have done in, in our life with them come alive again with us when we see an object that was a part of their life, do a situation in which, in which was meaningful for them and us, go to a place where we experience the love of a relationship. Those people come alive for us And even though they've passed on into God's presence, it's still not the end, is it? It's not the end. These things persist. This story today is a story of persistence. It's a story of persistence that's held within itself and a story of persistence that expands beyond it. Let me set the stage here. So, this is a crucial flipping point in the Gospel of Mark. We'll just recap a little bit. So, Jesus starts from Nazareth starts and goes to Galilee and he accumulates a few disciples at the beginning of the of the gospel of Mark we get Peter and then we get James and John and then we get you know we get, we start accumulating disciples and then the accumulation has happened and disciples have been gathered and people are following and they're moving from the end the the ministry has ended in the Galilee and they're moving towards Jerusalem He said it was on their way through Jericho. Jericho was on the way up to Jerusalem, and they had a group following. It was Passover time, plus they were followers of Jesus. He had accumulated a crowd at this point. Along the way, he had had several encounters that that we have looked at over the last few weeks. One, the rich young ruler who comes up to him, wants to follow Jesus, and then, but finds out that his possessions are too hard to give up. The last week, Julie preached on James and John wanting a place of prominence with Jesus and getting ridiculed by the disciples. And then we have Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus represents the last healing story in the Gospel of Mark. There are no more healing stories after this. It's the culmination. And this healing story is different from all the other ones beforehand. You remember at the beginning of Mark when Jesus heals somebody and, they, and he says, go back to your village and stay quiet about it. And no one ever did. They all rattled on about how great Jesus was in these places. And so he had, but he admonished people over and over and over to not tell anybody. Keep it hidden what God has done for you. But here 
we have, we have Bartimaeus sitting by the roadside being told that Jesus is coming, he's working his way through Jericho, and we have several things that are going on with Bartimaeus that I think are interesting for our thought. One, he's a beggar that has a name, Bartimaeus. He's not anonymous. There are plenty of anonym, anonymous people being, being healed in the Gospel of Mark, but Bartimaeus is named. And in fact, he is more than just named. His father is mentioned too, Timaeus. He's the son of Timaeus. Why are they mentioning this blind beggar and his father in this passage? Well, there's a, there's a history and tradition among the New Testament is that when these gospels were written, if a person gave, was given their proper name, generally they were a name that was known to the community of faith at that time. That Bartimaeus may have been a person who Mark knew about, or at least the story was so famous that he was, that he was given this name because he was a person who lived in the community of faith, the new Christian community, the followers of the way, who had been healed by Jesus, hung around with the group, and was a part of that group story, the, new, the formation of the new Christian church. And in fact, it was so important that he brought his family with him, and so that Timaeus, the father of Bartimaeus, is also a known name within that community. Bartimaeus does something that's really outside the norm. He calls Jesus by, the son, by a royal title, son of David, and then have mercy on me. It's interesting though, is that this is the first point in the, in the Gospel of Mark where the person being asked to be, who wants to give Jesus' attention, says, have mercy on me. That quote has been incorporated into Christian liturgy from a, probably about the first or second century on. There are lots of Christian liturgy where you talk about Christ, have mercy on me. So here's where it starts, right here. And then, He says, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, up to this point, Jesus has been one to say, shh, keep it quiet. But here he doesn't at all. He just says, well, what do you want? He doesn't protest anything. He just says to Bartimaeus, calls him here. Well, call him here. What do you want? I want to be healed. Okay, be healed. And then this is an interesting passage because... He do, Jesus doesn't tell him to go do anything. Other places he says, well, go wash your face in the river. It's one place he spits in his hands and puts saliva in the mouth or in the eyes. All these other, he just says, go, okay, your faith has made you well, you're healed. And Bartimaeus immediately follows Jesus. There's a couple things that happen, though, in this passage that we just kind of roll through really quickly, but we really don't see it going backwards or forwards. The first thing is, It says, Bartimaeus got up when he heard that Jesus was calling him and left his cloak. He left his old world behind and followed Jesus. A direct reference back to the rich young ruler who couldn't follow because he had too many possessions. So there's one. The second thing is is that he just accepts what Jesus does and follows without question where the disciples are just having an argument about where they should be and who's first and who's last and what's the place of of it all. And so Bartimaeus shows that a true follower just accepts the gift and follows. The third thing that happens is this looks forward to the point where in the next passage, in the next chapter, Jesus makes the triumphal entry into Jerusalem where they hail him as the David's heir. So it's almost a foretaste of what's coming up. So this bridge chapter holds a lot of different things together, holds it all together in, in in a change from the Galilee to Jerusalem. Here's this central pivot point that reflects backwards on things that were going along in Jesus' ministry up to this point and looks forward to this entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. It's not the end for Bartimaeus, is it? It's just that it's the end of one thing and the beginning of another. He's persistent. He says he called out many times, and even though people were trying to push him down or push him to the side, he prevailed. 
and he became a follower of Jesus at this point. Persistence is an interesting thing, isn't it? It's a hard thing to maintain, especially when things aren't going your way. Too often, the, our push to get things through is a reflection on our personality, that I'm not a hard pusher, not the hard salesman that says, you know, we encountered a hard salesman this, this week in Google Ads who's believed that we should buy this ad package. And you know, when someone pushes back on me and, and really says that I need something, my first inclination is to go, no, I don't. I don't need that. But he was persistent. So we'll see. But other, th other people are just like, well, that's enough. I don't, I'll roll over. Just get rid of that person. And so they're, they're, they, they have a fallback position. Other people, man, when you push that way, they're going to dig in their heels and they're going to push just as hard back the other way. I mean, that's, it, we all know people like that. We all know that people pers deal with situations differently. And it's based on personality. It's not a good or bad thing. It's just the way we're wired. It's the way we're wired. And so I don't want to say that one is better than the other, but we're like all personalities have certain ways of being in the world. The one thing that I would say, though, is that persistence does move us a little bit beyond our comfort zone. It, it kind of forces us just to go a little bit farther and to fight something that's coming our way or to achieve something that's just out of our reach or to move in a direction that we've never moved before. And we have to deal with the implications of that for good or ill. Sometimes we're pushed to those directions without even asking. We, we just end up in a situation where life's journey takes us places that we hadn't counted on and we have to deal with the implications of it. And, we, and we're, our persistence puts us in a new place much like Bartimaeus. It's interesting though is that Bartimaeus has always been pegged with blind Bartimaeus. Then he moved away and beyond his blindness and he moved into being part of the fellowship of Jesus along the way to Jerusalem. He's never mentioned again, but we could imagine he followed right along, was a part of the triumphal entry. Could have been at the Last Supper, we don't know. But his life from that point on, he was not tagged with blind. I doubt if people down the road years later, part of the Christian community, said, you know, would introduce him as, oh, the, John, this is blind Bartimaeus, where he could obviously see. He was Bartimaeus, a person who received the touch of Christ and was changed in an instant. This brings up a lot of interesting things to me, this passage, one of which is healing. Now, if you're like me, you have prayed for people to be healed. Hard prayed for people to be healed. Wanting specific types of healing in their life. And if you're like me, you've probably been disappointed because it didn't turn out the way you thought it should. And people make all kinds of excuses for that. Like the worst one is, well, it wasn't God's will to heal them which basically tells you that God is kind of like holding a scale. Oh, well, you weren't, he wasn't, or she wasn't good enough to be healed. That's the one that really turns people off from the faith. Lots of people leave church over that one. God, I prayed earnestly for God to heal her or him, and it didn't happen. I'm out of here because God doesn't care about me. The other one is, is that it gets some rationalizing. Well, that's really not what God wanted for that person. And that, and that we're just praying that God's will be done. That's kind of a way of backing away from it and still saying that, well, you know, it's still God's choice, but it didn't happen. But I don't feel so bad about that because I'm still praying that God's will be done. I have found, though, that everyone I have prayed for has been transformed in ways that I hadn't imagined. That is to say that those who I've prayed for who may have had cancer or had a job situation that wasn't working well or a relationship that was failing or you can fill in the blank, you've prayed for people, haven't you? I have found, though, that there's a transforming nature of me being involved 
with them and them praying as well. The transforming nature is that our eyes are open to see the world in somewhat different way. And if we're, if we're really honest about it, it may not happen the way that we imagine. But I've known some folks who were made into completely different people through the struggles that they were a part of and that they endured. Some of them lost their lives to what they were enduring, but they were transformed in the process. I've known people within this congregation, I've known people within my family who have been made whole through prayer of healing. Not that their bodies were healed necessarily, but their souls certainly were. And the way that they saw the world was different than what they were in the past. And so, and the most important thing is they were able to leave some stuff behind. For Bartimaeus is symbolized in that robe that he left on the side of the, of the road. But for others, it's leaving behind some guilt they had or perception of the world as being hard and cold or, or carrying some, something along in their long life history that has been a burden for them. And they've laid those things down in this process of really willowing through who they are as individuals with God and with the, and with the illness that they're carrying or the situation that they're in or who they, who they want to be. And they're healed. Too often we think of healing stories in the Bible as that of transformation of just like God gives a gift and sets it in their lap and ta-da, he was blind and now he can see. That can happen. I don't want to discount it. But I believe that healing happens in all of us. It's that persistence again, isn't it? That God is persistent with us. There is a type of, there is, if, if we believe that we need to be persistent in living, then we need to also believe that God is persistent with us and that we are being transformed through time and through our own living. Things that were once burdens for us sometimes just fall away and are no longer there. Sometimes we find in ourselves some strength that we didn't necessarily know we had. Other times we begin to understand that we are a part of God's loving community and can be transformed ourselves as we pray for people to be transformed in themselves. Bartimaeus went down the road, found faith in living, was transformed, I think, in a greater, in a greater way than just lo- regaining his eyesight. He left behind the world that he once had and found a new one that lied that laid with Jesus going down the road. We too are finding our new world with Jesus going down the road. Jesus is not an easy person to follow and at times it requires a lot of persistence to hang tough with Jesus. But we're being called and God is persistently loving us into a new place and healing us so that we can walk that journey as well. Amen.